Good morning and welcome to day 25 for financial accounting in the fall 2021 semester. Today our task is to finish up chapter 12. We'll see how that goes. We may or may not finish everything. If we do not finish the last exercises, because we do have quite a bit to do today, then I will simply move this due date for chapter 12 exercises until after the Thanksgiving recess. So we'll know by the end of class today. We have finished everything for exam four and the fourth part of the project. So those should be submitted no later than Sunday. You are welcome to uh, turn those in at any time um, so that you can then consider yourself done with accounting for the break. After Thanksgiving, so obviously no classes next week. After Thanksgiving, we have five classes left. Four of those will be covering new material, chapter 13. The week we come back, maybe finishing up chapter 12. Chapter 14, the um, next week, the first full week in December, we officially have class on the 14th, but I, we will not be covering new material on that day. It is a day that you uh, can you know, ask questions. You're welcome to log in or come to class if there's anything you need to talk with me, um, review something, but we will have finished up that chapter on the 9th. And then it's just up to you to finish the remaining pieces to complete the semester, the chapter 14 problem, the project, and the exam. So really after today, four regular class days to finish up our last two chapters. Any questions? So let's pick up where we left off last class. I did things a little bit out of order from the way they have them in the textbook and the way I have the, the way the exercises are numbered because to me, it makes sense to go through the whole life cycle of how does all this work? So we started with how does a company issue stock? What kind of terminology goes along with that in terms of authorized issued and outstanding shares? We talked about par or stated value being the minimum legal capital the company is required to report. We looked at recording the issuance of stock for cash and for assets other than cash. We looked at recording um, the additional excess paid in capital. We mentioned the idea of preferred stock, but we haven't, oh, and we did record the issuance of preferred stock, but what we haven't talked about is how dividends are, are calculated and paid out. And that's where we're going to pick up today. So the stock has been issued. Then the board of directors has met and they have declared a dividend. So I mentioned last class, there are three things that have to happen in order for a company to be, um, to declare and pay a dividend. So there's no requirement that a company ever pay dividends. And sometimes some companies don't pay dividends. Some investors don't want to pay, don't want to receive dividends. And we talked about that last class, why that might be the case. So in order to pay dividends, the company has to have the cash available. They have to have sufficient retained earnings because remember paying out dividends reduces retained earnings because those really represent earnings we did not retain. And the, div, the board of directors has to meet and take formal action to declare that dividend. We talked about the three relevant dates in our final exercise, which was exercise five on Tuesday. We looked at the declaration date we, when it becomes a legal liability of the company. We talked about the date of record. That date is not, uh, does not require an accounting entry, but it does determine the stockholders of record on that date are the ones who are going to receive those dividends, regardless of whether they sell the stock the next day or not. And then there's the payment date and there's going to be a lag of at least a couple of weeks and maybe even a month or, or more in between each of those dates to allow those um, changes to take place, to allow a stockholder who doesn't want to receive the dividend to have time to, to sell that stock. And then once the date of record passes, the company needs time to process that to know who's going to receive those checks. 
for the dividend. So that's what we covered last time. Any questions about any of that? So we mentioned preferred stock and I talked about the fact that preferred stock has preference over common stock primarily for an ongoing um, company, for a company that is you know, continuing um, in business. Primarily the important part is they have preference in the receipt of dividends. So they're going to receive their dividends before anything can go to the common stockholders. That's also true if the company were being liquidated or dissolved, first the creditors, then the preferred stockholders, then the common stockholders. So a company is not required to pay dividends, but once those dividends are declared, the preferred stockholders need to be paid in full first based on that stated dividend rate uh, times the par value. Again, we, I know we mentioned that last class. So in order to look at our first exercise, we need to introduce one other concept, and that is whether the stock is, preferred stock is cumulative or non-cumulative. This concept does not apply to common stock. There's no such thing as cumulative common stock. Common stock does not have a stated dividend rate. Preferred stock, though, um, is can be, and you would know at the time you purchased it, can be cumulative. What that means is, so I assume you all know what cumulative or accumulate means. It means it keeps adding up. So cumulative preferred stock means in a given year, if the company doesn't declare dividends, those dividends that did not get declared for the preferred stock carry over to the next year or to any subsequent year until all those dividends are paid. You can see the term right in the center of the screen in bold, those dividends that carry over are referred to as dividends in arrears. They're not a liability of the company. Remember the liability kicks in when the dividend is declared by the board of directors. So you're not going to see those on the balance sheet as a liability, but you would see them, you, re, you must see them in the notes to the financial statements. It's pretty significant. If you're considering buying stock in a company, whether it's preferred or common, you would want to know, do they already owe a whole bunch of money to the, to the um, existing stockholders? Okay, so if you're considering buying common stock and you want dividends, you would want to know this company hasn't declared dividends in like three years. And so if they do declare dividends next year, they have to pay the, the preferred stockholders three years worth of their dividends. Oh, and then by the way, the current year before anything goes to the common stockholders. So it is a requirement that they, that they tell you that. You, know, you have a right to know that if you are a prospective stockholder. And so in our first exercise today, we're going to be looking at that very situation where a company has cumulative preferred stock and they have not paid that dividend in full. And so those dividends and arrears carry forward. I already mentioned that. So let's go to our first exercise for today. Now I should clarify um, preferred stock can also be non-cumulative. We wouldn't have to distinguish it as cumulative if there wasn't the option of not being cumulative. If all of it was cumulative, we wouldn't have to state that. If, if preferred stock is not cumulative and a year goes by where a dividend is not declared, they just start fresh the next year. So there's no future right to collect the dividend for that year when a dividend was not declared. So there's no such thing as dividends and arrears for a company whose preferred stock is not cumulative. Make sense? Okay. Um, the other reminder we discussed last class, we only pay dividends on the outstanding shares. So a company might have authorization to sell a billion shares, but if they only have 10 outstanding, they're only paying dividends to the 10. 
They don't pay dividends on the issued shares. Remember the difference between issued and outstanding is the treasury stock. So if a company has treasury stock, if they repurchase their own stock, and we'll be talking about that shortly, a couple more exercises. Um, if they repurchase some of their own stock as treasury stock, they don't pay dividends to that. That would be paying dividends to themselves. I don't even know what that would look like. So there's no such thing as, as paying dividends on stock that is not in the hands of the public. So as we look at this exercise, you'll notice it tells us only about the stock outstanding. It does not even tell us how many shares they're authorized or how many shares they have issued, but may no longer be outstanding. The only, the only uh, share amounts we are given is the outstanding shares and that's all we need for this purpose. 72 Incorporated, a developer of radiology equipment, has stock outstanding as follows. 60,000 shares of cumulative preferred 2% stock, $60 par, and 300,000 dollars, sorry, 300,000 shares of $20 par common stock. The par value is significant for the preferred stock in calculating dividends. It is irrelevant for the common stock. The common stockholders get whatever's left and they share it equally based on the number of shares that they, that they have, or equitably, I probably should say. During its first four years of operations, the following amounts were distributed as dividends, first year and so on. So we'll get to each one of those. First thing I need to do is calculate what the total dividend would be on that, on that cumulative um, preferred stock. So there are 60,000 shares. The dividend is 2% of the par value. Open here. So 2% of $60, 2% of $60 is $1.20. Okay. So that means the full annual dividend is $1.20 per share. And there are 60,000 shares. I shouldn't have this one. I don't want to confuse people with my crazy math. So it's a dollar twenty per share. If we pay the full dividend, it would cost the company seventy-two thousand dollars. The full dividend for the year would be seventy-two thousand dollars. In the first year, they only declared $51,000 in dividends. Why would they do that? Well, because we already talked about why that would happen. Because in order to pay a dividend, you have to have the cash and you have to have the retained earnings. And in and the board of directors has to act, but, but they did. It says they distributed them. So the board of directors must have, have officially acted. What... Um, for a brand new company, it is highly likely that in their, in their first year, early years of operations that all those things aren't true. It's also likely true that they have a better use for the funds rather than just distributing them to their stockholders, that they can reinvest them as the company is getting started and growing. What that means though is at the end of the first year, when they have declared those dividends of 51,000, it does not mean that some of the shareholders receive their dividends. All of the preferred shareholders receive a partial dividend. So the 51,000 that was actually declared would be divided up among those 60,000 shares. And then, and then on their, On their, in the notes to their financial statements, they would include a note that says, by the way, 
we still owe $21,000 worth of dividends related to this year. If these were not cumulative, that would just go away and they would start fresh the next year. But because they're cumulative, they need to report that they didn't pay the full dividend. So how much of a dividend did the preferred stockholders get? Well, it was $51,000 and 60,000 shares. $51,000 shared equally among 60,000 shares is 85 cents per share, 51 divided by 60. Because the common stockholders are the residual equity and they didn't pay the full dividend to the preferred stockholders, then the common stockholders get nothing. Now, does that mean the common stockholders didn't make any money this year? No, it doesn't mean that at all. If the stock is seen favorably in the market, it's likely that the stock price will have gone up from the time those shares were first issued until the end of the year. And that also represents a gain or a return on investment for those stockholders, even though as we discussed last time, it's a paper gain or it's an unrealized gain as long as they continue to hold that stock. It is not um, correct to say, well, they didn't get a dividend, so it wasn't worth it. We don't know in this exercise. Questions so far? It's the, oh, sorry, I don't have my annotate up. Let me show I'll put the formula up here. So it's the $51,000 in dividends divided by the 60,000 60, shares. That make sense? There's nothing left. They they paid the full fifty one thousand. So we're told here that they paid. Oops, right here that they paid out fifty one thousand because that didn't cover what they owe to the preferred stockholders. There's nothing left for the common stockholders. So they are the residual. They get whatever is left. Now, as you see, there this company is increasing their dividends over time. And so in years that there is a lot of extra dividend, the common stockholders are gonna make out, right? They're gonna get more. The preferred stockholders, if there are no dividends in arrears, the preferred stockholders never get more than $1.20. It's a fixed rate, it's built in, it's just, it's kind of like the interest rate on bonds, it's fixed. So um, for any given year, $1.20 is what you get, unless there are dividends and arrears that they're catching up. So in, in year two, um, you know, they still owe $21,000 or 35 cents per share to those preferred stockholders. Their full dividend is $1.20. Last year, they only got 85 cents. So if enough dividends are declared, the preferred stockholders will receive $1.20 for the current year plus the 35 cents that's carried over in arrears from the previous year. That would be a total of 72,000 for year two's dividend plus the 21,000 dividends in arrears. So 72 plus 21 is $93,000. In the second year, the company declared $105,000 in dividends. So that will allow them to cover both last year's dividends and arrears plus the full dividend from this year. The first $93,000 is going to go to the preferred stockholders and they'll clear out the dividends and arrears. They've paid that off the first $21,000 plus another seventy-two dollars to cover year two dividend total of $93,000 divided by the 60,000 shares, that's $1.55 per share. It's the $1.20 for the year plus the 35 cents they still owe from last year. Now their total dividends that they paid is 
the total dividends declared was $105,000. The first 93,000 went to the preferred stockholders. And so the common stockholders get whatever's left, which is $12,000. That $12,000 is shared evenly across the shares and there are 300,000 shares of common stock. Four cents per share. Doesn't sound like much, but it's more than they got last year. Just checking my math. I've decided, I've discovered, I guess, that my stupid phone calculator if I hit the buttons too fast, it just doesn't read. I'm used to being able to just type as fast as I want on my calculator, and it just doesn't pick it up if I'm, if I'm too fast, so I have to be more deliberate about it. Make sense so far? In year three, they declare $81,000 in dividends. Now, uh, stock companies need to be or are typically very careful about what they do with their dividend policy because it sends a signal to the market. So what I'm going to suggest is this is a little odd, a little awkward that the, that the dividends are kind of up and down and all over the place. Normally a company wants to be more reliable, um, more steady, in their dividends, either they pay the same amount or they have a pattern of, of constantly increasing their dividend. In year three, the fact that they lowered their dividend from year two sends a negative signal. Are they in trouble? Why did they pay less dividends this year than they did last year? But um, we'll talk about that when we get to stock dividends in a little bit here. What a company can do if they if they can't meet those three requirements they don't have enough cash they don't have enough retained earnings or the board of directors fails to declare the cash dividends for whatever reason um, the board of directors can choose to issue a stock dividend rather than cash but we'll get there in year three what happened well they declared eighty one thousand dollars in dividends they don't have any dividends in arrears so the first $1.20 per share or $72,000 total goes to the preferred stockholders. And then whatever's left, which is $9,000, gets shared among the common stockholders. $9,000 divided by 300,000 shares. So this year they get a measly three cents per share. I feel like I should point out there are 3, 300,000 shares. That doesn't mean there are 300,000 shareholders. Most of those shareholders likely own more than one or maybe way more than one. There might be one shareholder who owns you know, 200,000 of those shares, we don't know. So three cents per share doesn't sound like a lot, but it is um, not likely that we're spent sending a lot of three cents checks to people. We would need to if they had just one share, but um, most of their stockholders probably have more than one share. We get through year three though, and we have no dividends in arrears. Again, we were able to pay the full dividend. And so in year four, when we declare $120,000 in dividends, the first 72,000 goes to the preferred shareholders to pay their year four dividend. We stay on track, no dividends in arrears. And then there's $48,000 left to be shared among the common stockholders. And $48,000 divided by 300,000 shares is 16 cents per share. Any questions on this first exercise? Yep, so 
they have declared $105,000 in dividends. The first thing they had to do was pay the 21,000 dividends in arrears from year one. Then they paid the full dividend for year two so that they're all caught up. So 21,000 to catch up those dividend in, dividends in arrears plus 72,000 for the year two dividend is $93,000. And that $93,000 was spread over the 60,000 preferred shares. Another way of, of looking at that, in year one, they got only 85 cents because they didn't declare sufficient dividends to cover the full dividend. So the full dividend is $1.20. They only paid 85. That means 35 cents per share carried over in arrears. And then they paid the full $1.20. So the $1.20 from year two plus the 35 cents remaining from year one. That's another way of looking at that calculation. That makes sense. You asked about the dollar fifty five, right? Is that what you wanted to hear? I know. Because I'm glad to explain it again or go through the calculations if you're not sure. Yeah, we go through it again. I'm going to say it one more time and then we'll move on. So in year one, they didn't pay the full dividend, right? They paid only 85 cents, but we know right here, the full dividend is $1.20, right? The full dividend is $1.20 is 2% of the par value. They didn't declare enough dividends to pay the full dividend amount. So part of that, 21,000 carried over to year two. Does that part make sense? So they only declared $51,000 in dividends, but the full dividend, $1.20 times 60,000 shares, the full dividend would have required 72,000 in dividends, but they only paid 51,000. So the extra 21,000 carries over to the next year because it's cumulative. You with me so far? You don't look like you're buying that part. Do you understand where the 72,000 came from? Okay, so let me walk through that part again. So preferred stock has a, a stated dividend rate, which is kind of like the interest rate on a bond. When you buy the preferred stock, you know that if the company pays dividends, they're going to pay you 2% of this $60 par value. So 2% of the $60 is $1.20. In a year when the company declares enough dividends, they're going to pay you $1.20 for your preferred stock. They have 60,000 shares outstanding. So if they pay 60,000 shares, $1.20 each, that's a total of $72,000 to pay the whole dividend. Does that make sense? It's kind of like interest on a loan. Remember I said last time, preferred stock is kind of like a hybrid between stock and bond. It does represent an ownership stake, but it's not voting stock like common stock. But it has a stated dividend rate, which is kind of like the interest rate on a bond that you know that if they declare dividends, they're gonna pay you that, that set amount, which happens to be 2% of $60 or $1.20 per share. So in any given year, if a company pays dividends, 
they have to pay the preferred stockholders their full dividend, $1.20 per share, $72,000 total in order to be caught up. But in year one, they didn't have sufficient funds or for they needed the money for expansion or whatever. And so in year one, they only declared $51,000 in dividends, which isn't the whole amount that they, that the preferred stockholders have earned. They, the whole dividend is 72,000, but they only paid 51. So they still owe them 21,000, the difference. Doesn't appear as a liability on their balance sheet, but these dividends in arrears of 21,000 would show up in the notes to their financial statements. Oh, by the way, we didn't pay the full dividend. So we're carrying over the rest of it because they're cumulative. It just keeps adding up until they've paid the whole thing. You get up to that point? Yes. As long as they declare the dividend. If they don't, they owe, and I wanna put that in quotes because it's not a liability. It doesn't become a liability until it's declared by the board of directors, but it, it attaches to the stock or it, it's earned and it, but it, it's, to, it's uh, noted in the financial statements, not on the balance sheet, but there's a note that says, oh, by the way, we still owe our preferred stockholders 21,000. We've written them an IOU, we'll pay them in one weekend. So in year two, when they declare $105,000 in dividends because they have some extra cash, they have some more retained earnings now, um, the first thing they have to do is pay off the dividends that they didn't pay last year. The first thing they have to do is pay that 21,000 from last year that carried over. Then they have to pay this year's full dividend of 72,000. Those two combined is the 93,000 that they actually paid. So now they're all caught up. The 93,000 they paid the preferred stockholders divided by 60,000 shares is where that $1.55 comes from. It's what carried over from last year plus the full dollar twenty from this year. And then after that, each year they have declared enough dividends to pay to keep current so they don't have any more dividends in arrears and the preferred stockholders continue to get their dollar twenty each year while the common stockholders get whatever's left. And in years that they don't declare a lot of dividends, the, the common stockholders get less. But in years like year four, where they declare a significantly larger amount, then the common stockholders are going to get more. And the other thing I should point out is we have no reason to believe that the preferred stock and the common stock were sold at the same price. They likely were sold at very different prices. So if you're looking at this and saying, well, if you have a choice between $1.20 and three cents, why wouldn't you take the $1.20? Well, the common stock is probably much cheaper for one thing. For two, the price of the common stock has a potentially unlimited upside, which means the price can keep going up and up and up where the preferred stock is gonna stick pretty close to that par value, just like we talked about with bonds. I don't know. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Going look like you're really unsure. Okay, so let's. So, um, journal wise, uh -huh. is there any difference? Right, so, say year two and year three were switched. Uh -huh. So, year three, they don't have enough to pay off all the arrears. Yeah. Now, would the first part of that 81 go towards the arrears and then they would essentially have money for year two in arrears? Does it make any difference on the books? Because it so, seems like it all shakes out. Yeah, so. so when they pay off, when they pay the dividends, the first thing they pay is the oldest dividends in arrears. So they don't pay the current amount and then cover the dividends in arrears. They cover the dividends in arrears. So if they had year one, they had dividends in arrears, the first thing they do is pay those off. And then if they have more dividends in arrears, then it would be from year two. Is that what you're asking? No, How you, yeah, like, so, does it matter in the books? 
around the financial piece of her. Does it matter? Does um, it? It's, I mean, the dollar amounts are the same. So yeah. I don't know whether it really matters whether you say these dividends and arrears are from 1995 or from 2020, but we wouldn't do it that way. You pay the oldest stuff first. Okay. It's kind of like FICO. Yeah. The oldest stuff first. Anything else before we move on? So we're gonna be moving ahead then to exercise six. Scroll down here. But I know I need to get my writing off the screen. So as I mentioned, we cannot pay cash dividends if we don't have the cash, if we don't have the retained earnings. But there is a desire by a, a company to have a somewhat stable dividend policy because investors like stability. They don't like volatility because volatility equals risk. And so there are some options. There is a, an option to declare a stock dividend. Now I'm going to tell you before we even start working on this that a stock dividend is really a psychological thing. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't affect the assets of the company. It doesn't affect the liabilities of the company. It doesn't affect the equity of the company. The only thing that is affected is the number of shares that are outstanding. But it's a larger number of shares outstanding, but each one of those shares is going to have a smaller value. So um, the stock dividend, the whole purpose is to send a positive signal to the marketplace about our, our belief that if we give you more shares of stock, we're giving you something of value, that we believe that it's worth it to you to have more shares. Yes, you have more shares, but so does everybody else that already had shares. Your proportional share in the company is exactly the same. So, and although this slide says a stock dividend only affects stockholders' equity, the total, I should clarify because I said it doesn't. The total equity remains unchanged. And if you think about it, that has to be true. If our assets and liabilities don't change and we have an equation that we've known since chapter one, assets equals liabilities plus equity. If assets and liabilities don't change, equity can't either. So the split of the equity between retained earnings, the internally generated capital and contributed capital, what was put in by the stockholders may change, and I say may, this says it does change. I'm telling you, it may change. It depends on how large that split it, or how large that dividend is. So it's kind of semantics, um, you know, a little bit of a um, being picky about the wording, but there are three different types of stock dividends. There's a small stock dividend, which is less than 25%. There's a large stock dividend, which is 25% up to, but not including 100%. And then a 100% stock dividend, we have a special term for that, we call it a stock split. And that could be a 100 or 200, it could be a one to one, a two to one, three to one, whatever you want. The reasons for doing those different levels of stock splits are different. The small stock dividend is typically, as I was just saying, because we wanna send a positive signal to the marketplace. A large stock dividend and certainly a stock split is um, designed for a different purpose. And mostly that is to, to um, keep the trading price, the market value of those shares in what you believe to be the ideal trading range for your stock. So let's look at, oops. so at the time that we declare a stock dividend, it, the, there are three dates that are relevant here, just like when we pay a cash dividend. There's the declaration date, the date of record, and then the payment, or in this case, distribution date. We're not actually paying, we're distributing 
those shares of stock. The, um, remember at last class, I told you that the common stock account, if there's a power of stated value, the common stock account must include only, and only include the par value for every issued share. Common stock dividends that haven't been issued yet cannot be included in that common stock account because they haven't yet been issued. So we'll see that in our next exercise, which is exercise six. So we're going to see an entry that looks similar to what we see here. But let's go to our exercise and we will do our own example. Healthy Life Company is an HMO for businesses in the Fresno area. The following account balances appear on Healthy Life's balance sheet, common stock. You'll notice that they have 3 million shares authorized and only 2.2 million shares issued. And we're assuming also outstanding. That means they have 800,000 shares to play with. In order to declare a stock dividend, you need to have shares available to distribute within your authorization. So if they had already issued and had outstanding 3 million shares, they could not do a stock dividend. So at that point, they would have a couple of choices. One is they can go back to the state in which they incorporated and get permission to sell more shares. That can be a costly and lengthy process to go through all the legal red tape of getting that. Another way of doing it could be to buy back some of their own stock on the open market. I suspect they wouldn't do a lot of that because Again, I suspect for a small stock dividend, the reason they're doing this is because they don't have the cash available to pay a cash dividend. So they also wouldn't have the cash available to buy back some of their own stock, which is going to cost more than the dividend itself. So, so it is important to note that they have shares available within their authorized limit. We have a par value. Um, we have paid in capital and excess of par and then retained earnings. So the company has retained earnings to cover the cost for the value of this dividend. The board of directors declared a 5% stock dividend when the market price of the stock was $18 per share. It is important to note that this um, is a small stock dividend, less than 25%. If it's less than 25%, if it's a small stock dividend, we use the market value at the time the, the dividend was declared as a proxy or as a uh, way of measuring the actual value. We do not do that for a, a large stock dividend or a stock split, anything greater than 25%, 25% or greater, I should say. And the reason for that is economics, because we know um, the law of supply, or sorry, the law of demand tells us all else equal, if there are more, um, if, there, oops, how do I want to explain this? if there are more shares out there, the price is going to come down. Okay. So um, the interplay of supply and demand is strictly economics. It doesn't make sense for us to say if we put twice as many shares out there, each one would be worth the same amount as it was before we put those extra shares out there. So we only use the, the market price as the value of the dividend when it is a small stock dividend as we have here. So let's figure out, let me get my... So the par value is always going to change though, correct? It would not or change not. for a small or a large stock dividend. It does change for a stock split. Okay, because the part is how much the company the minimum like legal capital. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. But it wouldn't change for a split, you're saying? Yeah. So and let me just, um, we'll talk about that when we get to the next exercise, which is about stock splits. I thought I was 99% sure I had a question on stock splits. So yeah, let's just hold off. And then if you still are wondering when we do the next exercise, we'll bring it up again. So let's figure out how much this, um, how much stock we're going to distribute. Get my calculator back on here. So it is 
there are 2,200,000 shares outstanding. It doesn't say that, it says how many we have issued, but we're going to assume that they're also outstanding in part because we haven't talked about treasury stock really yet. We're going to assume that all 2.2 million shares that are issued are also outstanding. And each one of those shares is going to be given an extra 5% of another share. So you had one share before, now you have 1.05 shares. If you had 10 shares, you now have 10 and a half shares, right? Yeah, 10 and a half shares. If you had, if you had 100 shares, now you have 105. So this stock split is going to issue or distribute 110,000 additional shares. 5% of the outstanding number. They have room within their authorization. That's critical. They could not do this if they didn't have room within their authorization. So on the date that the dividend is declared, it becomes a legal liability of the company to distribute this stock. We're going to record the value of the, the stock dividend 110,000 shares at $18. The total value of this stock dividend, theoretically, is $1,980,000. 110,000 shares at $18 per share. There's a, a hypothesis, a theory known as the efficient market hypothesis. And that says, that all existing information, all available information is incorporated into the price of the stock. And, and there's a lot of evidence that this is true. So stockholders aren't dumb. They know that nothing has changed for the company. The assets and liabilities remain exactly the same. So did we really just create out of thin air two million, roughly $2 million worth of value for the company? No. Nothing has changed. It's a psychological thing. We are going to move that value out of retained earnings, the, the internally generated capital, and into our permanent capital, the contributed capital section. As I already indicated, we cannot put the par value into the common stock account yet because that must happen when the shares are issued and they're not issued until the equivalent of the payment date, the, the distribution date. The par value on these shares though, 110,000 shares, the par value is $15 per share. What that means is when we issue the shares, that amount, $15 per share times 110,000 shares, it will end up in the common stock account. But for now we have it in this uh, kind of a holding account. It is an equity account, but it tells us those shares have not yet been distributed. Distributable sounds a lot like payable. It's gonna happen in the future. And then whatever's left, which is $330,000, it's okay for us to put that in the paid in capital and excess of par now, even though those shares haven't been moved yet, haven't been distributed yet. So this, this date is what would, or this entry is what would happen on the declaration date. It looks very similar to what we saw last class in exercise five when we did the cash dividends. We report the cost of the dividend and the value of the dividend, that's, that amount is going to be moved from the retained earnings eventually into the, into the common stock account. Now we move ahead and we get to the distribution date, which is going to be a few weeks later. And the company is actually going to distribute the stock. So we want to get rid of that common stock distributable. It's no longer distributable in the future. It is now distributed. 
And so that amount, the par value, is going to move into the common stock account. When we close our books, at the end of the period, at the end of the month, uh, that stock dividend is going to be closed into retained earnings, just like a cash dividend would be. It reduces our retained earnings. Any questions about those calculations at this point? Let's move on then to answer our, our last questions here. Determine the following amounts before the stock dividend is declared. So total paid in capital before the dividend was declared was the 33 million worth of par value plus the 9 million worth of excess. $42 million in total paid in capital before the stock dividend was declared. And the retained earnings was $89,550,000. Those are the numbers that were given to us in the exercise prior to the stock dividend being declared and then distributed. after the stock dividend was declared and distributed and the closing entry was recorded. So remember I said that when we do the closing entry, the full value of the stock dividend is removed from retained earnings and added to our contributed capital. So we already know that the total is going to be the same. The retained earnings is going to go down by that roughly $2 million. The retained earnings was 89,550,000. $89, but when we declared the dividend, we calculated the value of that dividend to be the 1,980,000 here from A1. And so our retained earnings goes down to 87,570. And our total paid in capital is going to go up by that same amount. Everyone who was a stockholder prior to this has 5% more shares now. The total value of the company has remained unchanged. So each of those shares is worth 5% less. And what I'm telling you, based on efficient market hypothesis, what I'm telling you is the day after the date of record, the shares, the share price will drop by roughly 5%. And that's pretty true. Pretty accurate. People aren't dumb. Any questions? Get my green check marks in there. So this is a small stock dividend where we use the market value at the time the, the um, dividend is declared to represent the fair value of that dividend. Questions, anybody? So just to mention, if this was a large stock dividend, 25% up to, but less than 100%. In that case, the entry would look similar, but once we hit that 25% mark, it's no longer reasonable to use that fair market value at the time the dividend was declared because we know that the price is going to fall and fall significantly the larger a percent that stock dividend is. So instead of using the fair market value, we would simply move the par value. There would be no paid in capital in excess of par. The par value would be moved from retained earnings into the common stock account. And then we're going to move on and talk about a stock split, which is really a super large, I guess, Stock dividend, anything 100% or greater. 
it really is a stock dividend, but it's a much larger version. So you can have a 100% stock dividend or a stock split that's one to one. If you had one share before now, you have two. You could have a two to one or even a three to one. So you had one share before, now you have um, three more, right? The typical bull shares or what they do on the 150% stock split. I have never seen a stock split that was anything less than full shares. I'm sure they could do a, a 150%. I'm sure they could. And I just never seen that happen. It's probably happened. I, I don't follow every single market transaction, obviously. So um, the stock split, the, the reason for a stock split is almost always, if not always, to lower the price of that stock. All companies have what they think is kind of the ideal trading range for their stock. What they think investors think is the value of that stock. Oh, that company should be selling at about X dollars. We know that there are two ways you make money by being invested in the stock market. Dividends is one and stock price appreciation is the other. So as, you, as the price keeps going up and it gets close to that ceiling for that ideal trading range, what we would expect and what actually does happen is you see that growth kind of slow down and it may be unrelated to an actual change in the company, but just that people start to think, hey, that stock's overvalued. In that case, they can um, affect a stock split, which means that they're going to you know, if it's a one-to-one -one or a 100% stock split, you had one share, now you have two. The intent of that would be to cut the price of the stock in half. And in reality, that's what we see happen is that the price would be cut roughly in half. And then it's gonna start climbing again, even though it had stopped you know, because it was hitting that kind of ceiling. The stock split does not require any kind of movement or reclassification of capital from the retained earnings into the, <coughs> into the contributed capital. We don't move any dollar amount. What happens though, is all of the numbers change. So the number of shares that we have, um, you can see here um, in this little bullet point, the stock split applies to all of the common shares. We have to have permission to have that many shares outstanding. But if it was a one-to-one -one stock split, the number of shares that are issued and outstanding doubles and the power value would be cut in half. So if it was $1 before the split, it would become 50 cents. If it was a three-to-one stock split, so you get three additional shares, we would have to cut it in what would that be by into a quarter, right? So it would be 25 cents instead of a dollar if it had been a dollar before. Three yeah, because then there'd be four shares rather than just one. Three oh, to one means you get three more. Two to one means you get two more for your for your one. Maybe I'm saying that wrong. 200 more cents. Yeah, so maybe I should have said a 300% or a 400%. Yeah, I may have just mis misstated that. Okay. So the exercise we're going to be looking at next, exercise seven, is for a stock split. Let's go to exercise seven. Selected transactions completed by Canyon Ferry Boating Corporation during the current fiscal year are as follows. Journalize the transaction. No entries required. Select no entry required. Leave the amount box is blank. So on January 8th, they split the common stock two to one. So that's a 100% stock split. They gave one extra share, so you had two before, and now you have, or sorry, you had one before, now you have two. They cut the par value in half. There are 300,000 shares outstanding where before the split, there were only 150,000 outstanding. 
there is no entry required other than a memorandum that just says, by the way, the par value is now half of what it was before. It was 100, now it's 50. But there's no accounting entry required. We don't reclassify anything from, uh, from retained earnings into contributed capital as we do for the small and large stock dividends. On April 30th, we declared semi-annual dividends of 60 cents per share on the preferred stock and 22 cents per share on the common stock, payable on July 1st. So the 60 cents per share, let me put the math on screen. Okay, so 60 cents per share for the preferred stock plus, oops, 22 cents per share for the common stock. After the split, there were 300 thousand shares of common stock outstanding. So that's $9,600 of dividends for the preferred stock. Add that to the common stock and I got 75,600 for the total Dividend, is that what everybody else got? This is the declaration date. So just as we did on Tuesday in exercise five, the declaration date is when we report the legal liability. We are now obligated to pay those dividends. There's no obligation at all up until the dividends are declared. For the preferred stock, if it was cumulative, if those dividends weren't declared, they would become dividends in arrears, but they don't show up on our balance sheet until they're actually declared. Then on July 1st, we're going to pay them. Very good so far. So we could have written it as two separate journal entries if if there was a reason to like if it didn't happen on the same day. You know, generally speaking, the board of directors is it doesn't meet weekly, so probably um, it if the board of directors was meeting, they would have just declared it together. Um, it's not incorrect to have it as two separate journal entries, but there's no reason not to just combine them. The end result is the same. I combine them because the template only gives us one, one spot to put that entry. So I assume that they wanted them together, but it's not incorrect to have it listed separately. Any other questions at this point? Next, on October 31st, they declared semi-annual dividends of 60 cents per share on the, on the preferred stock and 11 cents per share on the common stock. What? Before, before the stock dividend. Oh, but that they're gonna, they did another Stock dividend? Oh, they did. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Um, just got confused on what they were asking. So then they did a stock, they did a stock split earlier in the year. Now they're doing a stock dividend. As is sometimes the case, what we're given is not necessarily a realistic scenario, but it allows us to practice. It would be very odd for the company to do an 11 cent cash dividend and at the same time declare a stock dividend. That's kind of weird, but whatever. Let's do the cash dividend part first. And we have 
Again, the 60 cents per share for the 16,000 preferred shares and just 11 cents per share for the common shares. If I did the math right, that would be 42,000, okay. 42,600 worth of cash dividends that were declared. At the time they're declared, they become a legal liability of the company. Then they're going to report the 5% common stock dividend. So right now there are 300,000 shares of common stock outstanding. We declare a 5% dividend. That means we are going to issue an additional, whoops. We're going to issue an additional 15,000 shares. Just as we saw in the previous exercise, we need to report the value of that. Because this is a small stock dividend, we're going to use the market value at the time the dividend was declared. We're told that was $56. $56 for 15,000 shares is a total of $840,000. Again, because it's a small stock dividend, less than 25%. We use that fair market value as a proxy for the actual value. We can't report the par value yet in the common stock account because those shares have not yet been issued. So what is the par value? The par value is $50 per share. So $50 per share times the 15,000 shares that we are going to issue. 750,000 gets put into that common stock or stock dividends distributable account. And the rest gets put into the paid in capital and excess of par. The end result of that dividend is that $840,000 gets moved out of retained earnings into contributed capital the permanent capital accounts. Everybody good up to this point? Uh -huh. So the Let me back up for a second. I just want to say one, one thing, which is these transactions that we're talking about over these last couple exercises, really all everything today. Dividends is somewhat common, but it might be only annually once a year or quarterly, four times a year or semi-annually as you see here for the preferred stock. When I say they're common, it means that they're routine, but they don't happen daily. These types of transactions, the stock dividends, the stock split are uncommon. Many companies may never do those. So we're spending a lot of time in class talking about them because they're relevant for the stockholders equity piece, but they are not common transactions. What we're looking at here in October 31st were really two separate sets of, of um, events. The first one is they declared a cash dividend. And so we had to report the liability to pay that. The second thing that happened is then they declared a stock dividend. And so we had to report again, the cost or the value of that and the amount that's going to be distributed. This is the par value. And then how much is the excess? 
because it's a 5%, a small stock dividend, we use this $56, which is the fair market value of the stock. I'm not, I'm not clear why they have to estimate the value of the stock. If it's the fair market value, it's probably a, a, a stock that we can just look up the price. So I'm unclear. Like I need to see. So, um, it was unclear to me why they use that term estimated. It was just seemed kind of weird. But we had to figure out how many shares were going to be distributed. We knew there were 300,000 shares already outstanding. Told that on January 8th, and 5% more are going to be issued. So 5% of 300,000, an additional 15,000 shares are going to be issued with a presumed value of $56 per share. 15,000 times 56, that's where the 840 comes from. The par value, we were told at the beginning of the exercise was $50 per share. So that's what went into the common stock for Stock dividends distributable. You will sometimes see that account called common stock distributable. It means the same thing. It's the par value for those shares that are going to be distributed. And we can come down here and show what happens when we distribute that. That value, the par value of those shares moves into the common stock account where it must be once those shares are issued. So the end result is we have reduced our retained earnings and our cash when we pay the cash dividend. We will have reduced our retained earnings and our cash by 42,600 for the cash dividend. And we reduced our retained earnings by a total of 840,000 for the stock dividend but that 840,000 was just moved into contributed capital. It didn't go off the balance sheet. It didn't leave the equity section. We just moved it up into the permanent or contributed capital. So those two entries on October 31st are two very different things happening, cash dividends and stock dividends. Everybody good? All right, let's keep going. It's not looking like we're going to get through. I don't want to rush things. So it doesn't look like we're going to get through um, the remaining three exercises. I want to do one thing here. I just need to look at the chapter 12 problem. to see how much of what we haven't yet done is on the problem, I can't recall. Yeah, so you will actually be able to, to do, by the time we end class today, you will be able to do everything that's on the chapter 12 problem. So I will be changing the due date for the exercises but not the problem. So the problem will remain due on the Tuesday that we come back after Thanksgiving, which I think is the 30th. And now I've lost all of my green stuff. Hopefully you guys don't need yours. And let's move on to our, our, what will probably be our last exercise for today, which is exercise eight on treasury stock transactions. So I've mentioned treasury stock a few times Tuesday and then again today. Treasury stock results when a company buys back its own stock. The way they would do that is the same way you or I would buy stock in that company. You contact the broker and say, hey, start buying our stock. Now the company would wanna keep it somewhat quiet because it would likely raise the price of the stock if people thought the company really wanted to buy it back for some reason few different reasons that that would happen. One is pure economics. If we tighten the supply, the price is going to go up. Um, and that's what happens when you start 
pulling stock off the market, the supply becomes lower, less, and the price would go up. But also the comp the the um, people who own the stock would see an opportunity. Hey, the company really needs this stock back for some reason. Um, we can hold out for a higher price. And so um, the company would probably want to keep it a bit quiet that they were buying back the stock unless the reason they're buying it back at this high in a bullet point, unless the whole point is to raise the price of that stock. So we talked about stock splits as being a way of, of lowering the price of the stock, repurchasing our own stock, tightening up the supply is a way to get the price up. Okay, so we want to support that market price. We can reduce the supply of those shares. Not anything unethical or inappropriate. If you think about it, it totally makes sense. It makes that same company be held by fewer shareholders. So it increases the value of the remaining company for those remaining shareholders. Some other reasons um, is because we want to be able to use those shares for some other purpose, including to sell them to employees or to give them to employees at a, at a lower price. We don't have a lot of time today to talk about the, the use of stock options and maybe I'll do that um, when we come back. But in essence, a stock option is something that is granted to an employee as a form of payment, form of compensation. A stock option usually requires that the, the employee remains working for the company for some period of time after the option is granted until it becomes um, exercisable, until it um, reaches its exercise date. And usually the price of the option is going to be the current market price or something lower than that. So we talked about last class, I mentioned the concept of the principal agent problem that we have, um, that the owners of the company want to make money, the managers of the company want to make money for themselves. So one way to, to align those incentives is to make the managers owners. So you have a, a good employee, you want them to stick around a while, you give them some stock in the company but, and say they can get it at a bargain price but only if they continue working for the company for a year or two or three or however long the exercise window is. We also frequently will, will grant, I say we, I'm not involved in that. Options will frequently be granted where the strike or exercise price is the current market value. And so if the market value goes up, then the, comp then the employee would make money by exercising those options. So you tell the, the employee, here, I'm giving you options on 100 shares of stock, and you can buy them for $20 a share, which is the current market price. Well, the employee continues to work for the company. The company does well. The price goes up, and now it's $25. You've given them the ability, but not the requirement. Okay, it's called an option. You've given them the option of buying those 100 shares at $20, and they can immediately turn around and sell them for $25 and make $5 per share or they can buy them at $20 and just hold on to them if they think the price is going to continue to increase. In order to do any of those things, the company has to have those shares available within their authorized limit. And so that is a, a very real reason that companies may choose to repurchase their own treasury stock. They also might need to repurchase it because they want to use those shares, maybe they're trying to buy out um, or buy into some other company. They might do a swap of stock with that other company. So they would need their own stock available to do that. We are going to be using the cost method for accounting for treasury stock, which means everything in the treasury stock account, we report at the price we paid when we bought it from, our, um, from the you know, open market. Um, treasury stock is an equity account, but it has a normal debit balance. It reduces our equity. When we buy back our own stock, we have less equity remaining. No dividends are paid on shares of treasury stock. 
we've already pointed that out. You can't pay dividends to yourself. So treasury stock is stock that had already been issued, but is no longer outstanding. And so it doesn't receive any kind of dividends when they are declared. Let's go to, um, yeah, let's go to our, what will be our final exercise for today. I don't know whether we'll get through this whole exercise or not. There's 10 minutes left. Spray Company Incorporated develops and produces spraying equipment for lawn maintenance and industrial uses. On March 9th of the current year, Spray Company reacquired 62,000 shares of its own common stock at $51 per share. So let's journalize that. They bought back on the open market their own stock. We're using the cost method, which means everything that happens in this treasury stock account is going to be reported at that $51 per share. Everything in the treasury stock account is reported at our cost for it, the $51. So it's 62,000 shares at $51. Total cost, $3,162,000. Sixty-two thousand shares at fifty-one dollars each. When we buy back those treasury um, treasury shares, all else equal, nothing else happens. We would expect to see the price of those shares that remain in the open market go up, and indeed, it did go up to sixty dollars a share. And so, we are going to resell some of those shares. I'm assuming here that our purpose of buying those shares was to support the price, to make the price go up because we obviously didn't use them for some other purpose. We didn't give them to our employees or um, swap them with another company as an investment. When we resell those shares, 48,000 shares, that means we still have 14,000 shares left. We're gonna sell 48,000 shares at $60 per share. When we sell them, we're selling them for cash. It doesn't tell us anything other than that. We know that the treasury stock account must be accounted for at the $51 that we originally paid for those shares. 48,000 shares at $51 a share We must account for those at cost at $51. I should have pointed out on March 9th, we debited treasury stock. That's an offset or a reduction to our total equity. When we get there in another 14 days, it'll be 14 days or 12 days, I mean, before we meet again. Um, when we come back to class after Thanksgiving, we'll see how treasury stock is reported on the balance sheet. It is reported in the equity section, but it's a reduction, it's an offset to our equity. Now, what's the other part here? 288, 2,880,000 minus 2,448,000 is 432,000. What are we going to call that? Well, what happened here? We bought back the stock for $51 and then we sold it for 60. It would be really nice if we could say, hey, we just made money on that. We could report a gain on our income statement, but we can't do that. We do not get to report that we made money by selling our own shares. However, it does impact the value of our company. And we're going to call that paid in capital from the treasury stock. We'll see this again when we come back to class after the break, but it is possible, it is acceptable to report all the paid in capital, whether it's preferred, common, or treasury stock. It is acceptable to lump those all together and simply have one line that says paid in capital. I tend to prefer reporting it separately. Here's the paid in capital from the common stock. Here's from the preferred stock. Here's from the treasury stock if you have all of those. Questions so far?
so when we bought the treasury staff back here on March 9th, we set up that and we started using that account. Now we're, we are crediting that account to make that amount smaller so that we take the 3162, subtract the 2448, that will represent the 14,000 shares that we have left at $51 per share. It's the $51 per share. We're going to report it at cost, meaning at what we had paid for it. So it always has to be $51 per share for those shares that we bought for $51. So we sold 48,000 shares. We're going to take $51 out of the treasury stock account for each one of those 48,000 shares. On November 13th, then we're going to sell another 7,500 at $54. So this transaction is going to look basically the same. As the June 9th transaction, we're going to report the cash we received, $54 for 7,500 shares. The treasury stock piece has to be at $51 a share because that was our cost. And then the paid in capital is going to be what's left. Whatever we need to make this entry balance. Anybody questions? So I just have to tell you, I just realized I was stepping away from the camera, which I try not to do too much. I was just reading a proposal the other day, someone had suggested that we need cameras in the classroom that track the movements of the instructor. That really kind of creeps me out to think that it's following me around. I'd kind of rather that I can step off camera if I need to for some reason. That has to be pretty expensive technology to put that into all the classrooms where we use cameras, I would think. What is the balance in paid in capital from treasury stock on December 31st? So we have two entries for paid in capital here and here. Two entries into that account. The total was four hundred fifty-four thousand five hundred, and that would be a credit balance that increases our equity. We sold those shares for more than we had paid for them. Kind of like we made money, only it doesn't affect our income statement. It only affects the balance sheet. What is the balance in the treasury stock account? So. Here are our treasury stock transactions. We started with $3,162,000. Then we subtracted or credited to that account $2,448,000 and $382,500. And so the balance would be, if I did the math right, $331,500. And that would be a debit balance. That treasury stock account, as long as it has anything in there, it has to be a debit balance. Treasury stock cannot have a credit balance when we use the cost method. How will the balance in the treasury stock be reported? It's as a deduction or an offset to stockholders equity. And because it's still 944, any questions on, on any of that? I would quickly just click to 945. Let me show you one thing while it's fresh in your mind. Probably can't see that very well. But these are the, um, this is an example of the balance sheet where you can see that this treasury stock is the very last entry in the equity section. It's shown as an offset or a negative. It reduces our equity. 
these two balance sheets are the two different ways of recording that paid in capital, the excess. The first one shows the paid in capital um, in excess of par separately for the preferred, for the common, and for the treasury stock. The second method shows just one line for additional paid in capital that is for all of those preferred, common, and treasury. So the end result is the same. Our total stockholders equity is the same. It's just a matter of how much detail you want to give about where that additional paid in capital came from. And that is the end of our class for today. As I said, I will be changing the due date for the exercises because we'll do check exercise nine and 10 when we come back after the break. Any questions anyone might have before we call it a day? Yeah, so it was, I started with, here's what we put in there. And then here are the two amounts that we took out. The question was for letter C, where did the treasury stock dollar amount come from? So it's this 3,162 minus the two credits to that account. Really what we're doing is just finding the balance in that account. Any other questions? All right, well, happy Thanksgiving and I'll see you all in about 12 days.